Um, Again, my name is Mike Eldridge. Uh, just a real quick history on me. Um, my father started a rail construction company 40 some odd years ago. I eventually became partners with him and a couple other guys in the early two, 2000s. And we sold it to uh, Berkshire Hathaway in 2011. And I worked with them as a manager until about three months ago when I joined up with VAA. So I've been in the rail construction business for 18 years. Now I'm kind of changing hats and going more toward the engineering and design side. But as a contractor, we worked with VAA all the time building the, building the tracks that they designed and just really enjoyed working with, with these guys so very excited to be here. Um, so the purpose of this program is, or this presentation is, as 18 years as a contractor, I've, I noticed that there was not a lot of, we tried to interact with our customers, but they didn't really seem to care. They just wanted us to come in, fix their tracks, and go home and be done with it. They were more concerned about their buckets, their elevators, their steel, their furnaces, whatever industry we were working at. So there wasn't a lot of interaction. <laughs> but we also noticed that, you know, early in my career, that we would go repair a track, and then when we get a call two months later, hey, you got a broken rail, and the customer would be mad, and we'd go back, and we're like, well, you know, rails break, but if you would have called us when this was happening, this was an indication of this was getting ready to happen. So we, at that point, we kind of made an effort as, a, as my old company to educate um, our customers on what to look for so they could help us maintain their tracks better because their guys are out on the tracks every single day, running the engines, mowing the grass, whatever it is. So they're seeing things that a contractor or a, or a VA as a consultant can't see on a regular basis. So when Jeff asked me to come up with a presentation, I thought you know, it would be great with VAA's knowledge to explain to customers um, things that they can do to help us and or their contractor to, to, to build a teamwork, to help reduce um, costly dangerous, and dangerous derailments. We all know what a derailment is, they're very costly. Um, so it's just important to build that team and, and also because unfortunately this world kind of boils down to money, by having a track maintenance program, by developing a team, you as a customer or as a plant manager or you know, operation manager, you can help budget yourself your money a lot better if you know kind of, if you have a program and a plan with, with your team. So we are out on a, facility, a local facility doing some training yesterday and we ran across a, a, a switch that actually had quite a few problems. And the customer that was walking with us says, well, I got two trains coming this week, am I gonna derail? And I refer to this analogy that I've been using for a long time. Tr finding track defects is like a crack in a windshield. So we've all had the crack in the windshield that we know we can take it to the auto guy and he can put that little machine on and fill it with resin and it goes away and we're fine. But I, I got time. Three days later you run across a rail set of railroad tracks, you bump and the thing shatters. That's kind of like rail maintenance. We can find defects. We can tell you that, yeah, you, you have a dangerous area, but it's almost impossible to tell you when it's gonna happen. Now, there are some things out there, a broken rail, you know, a chip or a head that falls off of a rail, which happens. There are certain things, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna derail next train. And who knows what red flagging is? <laughs> okay, I, I think we have a representative from BNSF here, James. And what happens, a lot of times the railroads will come in and they'll stop their, their tracks. And it's, I think a lot of roads are like once a month they're going in and doing a, a, an inspection of the industry's facilities just to make sure they don't have any red flag issues. But that train comes in, the guy gets out, he goes to the first switch and sees there's a broken rail, he won't come in. The facility is now red flag. So that train goes back to the depot station or wherever it goes, and you start paying to merge as a customer. $200 a day from how many cars have to be stored somewhere. So that can add up pretty quick. So if you can develop a teamwork with your consultant, contractor, it will help reduce some of those very costly um, issues. <coughs> you know, we all seen a derailment. They're horrible. You lose downtime, you lose product, it's dangerous. You know, so that's, that's what the whole goal is, creating the teamwork is to help reduce derailments. <laughs> Real quick, and I got 45 minutes here. It probably almost, I mean, there's courses taught on this for weeks and you know, so I'm gonna go through this very quick. But again, it's a big picture of, for those of you who are at the industry level that are on tracks, kind of have a basic understanding of what a consultant contractor looks for when they come in. But to understand the overall pick, or the kind of 
what TRAC is designed to do is you're going to have your subgrade, and when tracks sink, the rail contractor always gets blamed for the track sinking. It's never the rail contractor. It's, it's, a, it's a poor subgrade. So subgrade, if you're building a new facility, critically important. It's designed right. Call VAA. Um, get the proper compaction. Geotech studies tells you how much sub ballast to have, which is the smaller rock, usually three quarters down to fine. That goes underneath, that's on top of the subgrade. It's always sloped, so it'll shed water to the ditching areas. Then right under the tie, you'll have your top ballast, which is a bigger rock, two inch to one inch, usually clean, and its purpose is to percolate water down to the sub ballast so the water can get to the, to the drainage. Then obviously you have your tie and your rail. Um, a lot of people skim, uh, you know, in my years, I could see they did, tried to save money by not doing the foundation right, and that's where you end up having some long-term problems. <coughs> Going into uh, foundations and mud and so forth, um, when you see we have a bunch of grass, and when, you know, we, we, and I saw this, you know, daily or weekly as a contractor, you know, a lot of people didn't take a lot of consideration about mud and stuff so in their tracks. But if you see situations like this, now this isn't something that's going to come up out, you know, quickly. Your contractor consultant should be taking care of issues like this. I just brought this up so if, if they're not, you need to talk with them and ask them why not. Because if this, this will cause problems. And as we go through here, if there's any questions, I know I'm, you know I'm talking quick, there's a lot to go through in a short amount of time, but raise your hand, throw something at me, whatever you need to do, um, we'll stop and talk about it. <laughs> um, the main area that um, causes problems are at switches or turnouts in, in, in industries. Most, I, would, I don't know, I've read anywhere between 80 and 95% of industry derailments are at the turnout area. Um, as a contractor, we would get calls sometimes, hey, I got a broken rail. <laughs> so we'd, we're at, well, it's, it's in our track. So we'd get a rail, we'd go out, and it'd be a stock rail, which is this rail right here. That's the rail that the points fit up against. Well, that's a, that's a little different animal. It, so we'd be unprepared to take care of the customer because they couldn't communicate with us. Or they say, we got that one thing right, right in the middle of the track that's broke. Well. You know, so we're thinking that a switch, maybe it's a number one rod, which is this here, a number two rod, sometimes called a switch head rod or a switch back rod. So we'd be prepared to fix this, but it might be, they were actually talking about that thing in the middle, which is a frog. <laughs> so now be honest, how many people knew what a frog was before they got into this industry? So, you know, I remember being 11 years old or 12 years old laying in bed thinking, what is dad talking about on the phone? What's a frog I do with the railroad? And so finally I asked him, I said, dad, what's a frog? You know, and so, you know, back, that was before internet. So he actually got a picture out of a book and showed me what a frog in with, with the railroad. And we're going to talk a little bit more about them here in just a little bit. But this is your frog of a turnout. Again, these are your stock rails. You got two stock rails. Um, that's what your switch points, which these are the switch points here. So your switch points butt up against the stock rail. Your number one, number two, or switch head and switch back rod. This is your connecting rod. This is your switch stand. You know, some of these the leads and switch things and that stuff like that, it's more from a design standpoint. But understanding the terminology, I think, is very important. And we're going to talk, you'll see more details, and we're going to talk about some maintenance issues around switches. So you could call your contractor and say, hey, I've got a, I've got a stock rail that's broke. <laughs> And then you, they could ask you some questions and they'll know how, how to come out to fix it, what they need to get you back in service. Because <clears throat> usually if you have a broken rail, it's, you find that out as the train is sitting and waiting to come in or the train's inside your facility and it needs to come out and it can't because there's a broken rail. <clears throat> so when a contractor is looking at your tracks, he should be walking your tracks no matter if you get one mile or 10 miles. The number of times he's in your facility is based on how much track you have and how much train movement you have and the overall condition of your track. But if he's not physically walking every piece of your track, then you know there, you probably need to talk to him and ask him why not and get him to do that. Because that's the only way you're gonna see some of these issues. <laughs> but it's very important right in front of the points to make sure that your gauge is correct. 
I'm not going to tell you what that gauge is because there's going to be a, a slide here where someone's going to get a chance to win a VAA hat. Five ties in front of the points <laughs> you want to make sure are solid, gauge holding, um, no standing spikes, the gauge is, all, is good up to this area, this is, a, this is a very critical area. A lot of contractors will put a, this is what they call a double acting gauge rod. It actually just clips at the base of the rail and these, it's just a, like a big turnbuckle. They turn it and they bring their rails tight and they get it to 56 and a half and they call it good. So it, the gauge is fixed, but that's just, that's just a safety net. That's just something that they do in a pinch, in an emergency, but you need to make sure that these ties are in good shape. <laughs> um, and we saw this yesterday when we were making our little inspection. Um, the, again, what, what rail is this that the point butts up against? Who said that? Are you VAA? No. I'm not supposed to do this. That's a violation of safety rules, but I'll, I'll look. <coughs> <Yeah. coughs> oh. So there'll be overflow, which if you would fill your hand on the top of the rail, right here at this, you'd feel like a little lip. That's called, that's called overflow. It's, uh, Every time someone comes into your facility, they need to check every switch and make sure that overflow is, is ground off. Um, what we saw yesterday was what, three eighths of it, three eighths of an inch. So what happens is that switch point, when it butts up against the stock rail, it's actually hitting the overflow, not the rail. And it could just take one car, one wheel to go through that, that overflow comes off, and now you've got a gap in between your stock rail and switch point. So the flange of a wheel can actually go right in between and that's what causes a lot of the derailments. You know, we, we, it happens, and fortunately it happens all the time. So again, I'm not really teaching you how to do track inspections, I'm teaching you to, to, to interact with your contractor and consultant. If after they go, you go out and check and make sure that you got what you paid for, you, that's, that's a critical area for you to and it takes three seconds to just reach down and grab the rail if, it's, if you feel that lip. <laughs> um, Again, you when you throw your switch stand, let me ask, is there, are how many people are here and maybe you can tell me online if anyone raises their hand online, actually are in charge of their tracks at their facility? Is there anyone here? <laughs> okay, so I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, won't spend some detail on some of the smaller things here, but a, a contractor is to make sure you got proper switch, attention on your switch stand. Um, and that all the joints are the, have proper angle bars and the, and the holes are filled and all the bolts are tightened. <laughs> um, we put this together. Um, we actually, as a company, wrote an article for Grain Journal and we put a link in here um, for people to go on to to um, help them see what their facility, what their folks at the job or at the plant, at the industry can go out and implement into their weekly, monthly, whatever uh, maintenance program they have, things that they can check for. Um, we have put my cards back there by the food table. So if it's something that you would want the link emailed to you, where you can go in and you know download it and look at it, my number's on there, you can call and ask some more questions. So my cards are back there, please take one, send me an email, and we'll make sure that you get a link um, to this that uh, we have put together. <coughs> All right, here's a chance to win a hat. Okay, what is this? Okay, now here, here's where you win a hat. What type of frog is this? James, you can't answer. You know? <laughs> okay, it's a, what they call SMSG. It's a self-guarded frog. Um, this is what they call a flat top frog or, or, or an RBM, and this is a guardrail. You'll see these type of switches and, and all mainline switches will have this type of frog or some different, there's spring floated and lift frogs, but you'll never see a, a self guarder frog. This is more for, for industry. But basically you got the guardrail built in, you can see that little lip here, or the, the rise there. And it basically what that does, it is, it, it's kicking the rail to make sure it's getting down the right side. So you can have a self guarded frog or a, a, a frog with a guardrail. Um, so you don't, so there'll be more chances when hats. So again, you're looking at, this is called the half pointer frog. 
and these are the risers of the frog. The risers are what the reel runs on, and it's designed to lift the wheel over the frog and actually not touch with the point of the frog, and the wheel will actually interface with the rail again when it gets farther back where it's thicker. So you will see a lot of times these risers have worn down to where you're hitting that frog and it's, and it's chipping the point off. So again, after your contractor leaves and he has, and you go out and you check things, if he hasn't addressed a chipped a crack, um, you're seeing a lot of wear. A lot of times these, these can be repaired by welding. Maybe that weld has broke loose. This is where you need to call him back, say, hey, something doesn't look right. Or with modern technology, you know, six months after he's gone, something happens because you can take a picture of it and he can at least send it or send it to VAA. We can look at it and at least give you a, hey, no, you need to stop right now until you know, someone actually just physically looks at it. Um, again, you can save a lot, of, a lot of headaches if your guys will go out and look at this on a regular basis. Um, Surface and elevation is really important in the turnout areas. Um, all right, well, another hat. What's, give me two things wrong with this, what you're seeing here. I can't answer. Yeah, I know you can't. Yeah, that's what I already told you. <laughs> All right, around the, around the switch stand, you should have a walkway, and this is more from a safety standpoint for, for your crews. If they're out trying to throw that stand, there's, you're, they're standing below, there's, there's poor footing, and railroads will, and James can probably attest to this, if, they, if this condition persists and they ask the industry to fix it, they don't, they'll, they'll red flag you because this is a safety issue for the railroad. If this, is your, if this is your main switch leading into your facility, they will red flag you, then you start your demerge cost again. Look at, look at the ties, how they're, they're uneven. You can see a lot of bad timber, or excuse me, timbers in here. Um, so it, with, throughout your switch, which starts from your, your head block timbers, what you're here, that your switch stand sits on, then it throws your points all the way out to the last tie it's a long tie, it's called the LLT, or last long tie. That is your turnout. So you want pretty much every timber in your turnout to be in good shape. You wanna make sure the gauge is good, the points are, are in good shape, there's no overflow, the stuff we talked about earlier, but surface and elevation is very important in a switch area. <laughs> this particular situation, who can see what's wrong with this one up here to the right? <laughs> well, we can see right here, <laughs> That rail dips real bad right out of the frog area, and I would venture to guess if we put a cross level on this, those two rails are sitting at an angle too. <laughs> um, I had this almost exact situation out in a grain elevator out west, and I gave them a quote to, to repair it. And it's, this has probably been 12, 13 years ago, so my number is going to be slightly off, but it was, it was somewhere between 30 and 40,000 because we were going to do some other repairs, and basically we were going to cut that track out put a new foundation in, put it back in, and then raise it to the proper level and retamp it. And he actually got kind of crappy with me, thinking I was trying to, you know, you know, tell him things that weren't needed. Well, three weeks later, I get a phone call from my foreman at three in the morning, hey, this company just derailed. I said, where'd they derail it? And it was right at that switch. Well, they put seven grain cars on the ground, and I don't know what the cost of grain was at that time, but well, they hold 3,500 bushels each, plus or minus. So there's 22,000 bushels of corn laying on the ground. It destroyed three of the rail cars that were owned by James Company. So I don't know what a rail car cost, James. Do you have any idea? Yeah, I don't know what the, a couple hundred thousand. I don't know what they what they are. A lot of steel on them. They weigh 100 tons. So. That, that derailment probably cost him, I'm gonna guess, three to $400,000 to repair, where he could have easily prevented that by just doing some simple maintenance. So, you know, budget concerns, poor year, COVID, there's all sorts of things that come into making the decision not to repair or whatever. But again, it's why it's really important to, you know, maybe have a contractor and a consultant to kind of give you that check, you know, especially if you have a lot of high traffic area to make sure that, okay, yeah, we don't have the money, but if we don't spend it now, we're gonna be in, we're gonna be in some seriously bad shape or potentially. Um, so 
uh, again, th these right here along the edge of the timbers and, and ties, it's the same thing um, that's called shoulders. It, what the shoulder is, you should have a level amount of rock, the proper rock, out nine inches and then, then before you start your slope. So it's real important to have, and you'll see a picture up here of a curve that's in really bad shape, but it's important to have proper shoulders along these turnouts. Um, so if uh, your guys are out there every day for whatever reason, you might, you might have some issues, you might, for whatever reason, that ballast, actually we've seen ballast shoulders put in good shape, we put it in, and then three or four months later we get a call and we go back and the ballast is all washed away. So at that point, there's, there's something going on, so we gotta figure out what that is. <laughs> yeah. So like in this case, not necessarily your, the, what you did out west, but you know, it's a temporary fix. Could they have come in, put some ballast down, and tamped it just to, just to raise it up, make it level? Absolutely. Just so they weren't spending the 30 or 40, but maybe they're spending, I don't know, five or six. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, and because that's, that's, that's all you can do. Um, but just, it's just good to know that when stuff like this happens, it's not the track, it is the foundation. That's the only way to repair it, but absolutely you could. All right, so here's a chance to win a hat. <coughs> Who can tell me what the proper gauge or where it is? 56 and a half. All right. Oh, man, that's a horrible throw. Good thing no one was sitting in that chair, Jennifer. I'd be in trouble. All right. <laughs> Who can tell me why a picture of a chariot's up here? Because the rail gauge is derived from the width of a Roman chariot. Yes. All right, Jeff Duck. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, so their rail gauge is 56 and a half inches, four foot eight and a half. <laughs> um, George Stevenson was an engineer back in northern England back in the 1800s, and when they started using horse drawn buggies or, or you know, carts on rail, they basically put the rail in the same location where the carts were going. And that's kind of, it was, about, it was about four foot eight and a half. Well, research has shown that that was also about the same width of the Roman chariots. So the theory is, even though Snopes or whatever that fact checking organization is, says there's really not a lot of basis. And what's your name, sir? Andrew. Andrew. And what, what Andrew said, there is also some, some truth to it that, so the carts were derived from the chariots, rail was derived from the carts, so thus you can make the logic. <laughs> Um, so there's, all, there's in today's world, like 55 to 60 percent of all rail is still a four foot eight and a half. But there are still some other places that carry freight and stuff that have different have different um, different gauges. But I believe it was in 1863 under the Lincoln administration when they were building the Transcontinental Railroad, they kind of adopted four foot eight and a half. So since then, it's been four foot eight and a half in the United States. Um, for another what's hat. The tolerance on that? What, what's the tolerance on that gauge? Great question. 58 and a half inches or greater, you're probably going to derail next time you run a train over it. <laughs> if we, as a contractor, if we got to 57, this is how we, we de develop teamwork with our customers. We'd say, what's your name, sir? Marcus. Marcus? Marcus. Mar hey, Marcus, this is at 57 inches. I'm not going to ask you to spend money right now to fix it but I want you to keep an eye on this for me. And so, because at that point, there's no sense of spending money because it's not bad. Now there's some other things we'll be looking for. Um, at the end of the ties, if we saw the, the track was deflecting, you'd see a void between the tie and the ballast. Okay, there's, there is something going on that we need to fix it now. Um, it's very possible that it was just built at 57 inches too if we're not seeing some other indications. This is where developing the teamwork, kind of where this whole, you know, idea around this presentation is, is for your customer or your contractor or consultant to say, okay, we're not, we're not going to force you to spend money now, but keep an eye on it. <laughs> and the next time, if you call me and say it's 57 and a half, okay, now we know something's, okay, something's wrong. We got we to gotta investigate and repair it. Um, in curves, a lot of times they will actually extend eighth of an inch per two degrees of curve. So you might actually have gauge, all right? Maximum allowable degree of curve of railroads right now. 
this is done. Jay, oh, I'm going to let you answer this one. I'm not going to throw it down for there's too many people I might hit all your hat up here. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, there's typical degrees of curve that that's, that's all you're allowed. Um, sometimes, though, there's, there's still tracks and service that were built 60, 70, 80 years ago where you might have the 17, 18 degree curve. Trains will navigate those, but it's going to, it, it's going to destroy your track. It'll cause a lot of maintenance issues. So, and it was, in those situations, you might actually have some wider gauge that I'll be real concerned about. But if you get to 58 and a half to 59, you're, you're going to drop. Can I ask another question? Yeah. So, on a Tuesday night, you know, you know, you wood tie versus concrete that you're showing there or metal ties, does that change? Not the tolerance, but does it change how much maintenance occurs or how far that can push out, especially in the Yes. Yeah. Um, these are okay. He's asking the difference. This is a concrete tie. There are also steel ties versus a traditional wood tie. If there's tolerances in between the different structure of ties, um, and the answer is yes. Um, concrete ties and steel ties are manufactured with a, what they call a pandrel plate. Uh, that, that actually clips the rail onto the tie, and they're manufactured to proper gauge. A wood tie is, you know, again, I'm not to complicate it. You can order wood ties with the tie, tie plates already on them to gauge, but most of the track is built, stick built, where the contractor is making the gauge. They're using this, something, this is a level, but they also have something that looks very much like this that gives the contractor the proper gauge when they build. So to answer your question, if you, Concrete ties and steel ties are not going to have a issue with wide gauge. The problem is that if they, they there is no forgiveness. So if you have a 550,000 pound locomotive that for whatever reason has a wheel that's not slewing right, or you know there's other variables, we've seen them actually snap the clips and roll the rail over because there is there is no forgiveness. Far less likely to happen than, than wood ties losing gauge. Great question. Any, any other question? All right, so we were talking about the shoulder. I got one hat left. What's the shoulder of ballast? What's it? Are you talking like distance? What's that? Are you talking like distance? Not distance, but just in theory, what, what is it? Uh, it's a flat part of the ballast that goes past the tie and kind for stability. Okay. Even though your VA is going to give it to you. <laughs> I feel the wind. Oh, that's wrong. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so especially in curves, because this is a lot of force push on the outside of the rail. If there's no ballast on, this, on your shoulders here, this, this, this could be uh, you know, catastrophic on the very next train. Um, again, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. So as far as that team works, Synergy of, oh, hey, something changed, call, you know, what's going on here? You know, this is something where sometimes, you know, you, you may, if you're an industry, you may not have the budget to fix it. And I can you know, bore you with stories of where this has happened to me. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. I was so popular, I get two mics. You talk. All right. <laughs> Um, so this is something more just from an educational standpoint, is that if you have this condition, um, you want to make sure that you, you find some money in your budget to get that repaired. Um, added to that, if you have failed ties in this area, you're just adding to the to the chance of something very bad happening. Because at this point, you know, this is a curve, I, you know, um, and I basically just went on Google, found some, some pictures and, and, and took off the web. So I can't tell you all the history. Um, it looks like there's a switch, obviously, this is coming off a switch. So you're probably not going very fast there. But if this was just a routine curve, 
you know, you, you know, a plant speed limit's normally seven to 10 miles per hour. If you're going that fast with a six axle locomotive and you have no ballast to, on your shoulders, that's gonna create a, a huge problem. But just from my experience, fixing ballast conditions was one of the last things industries would like to spend money on. So, now, I'm out of hats, but this actually doesn't look too awfully bad, does it? Or do you, think, do you, do you see a, a problem with it? I'll even open up to the VAA guys. I don't know what you're gonna get. Maybe I'll, Jeff will give you 20 bucks. <laughs> Is it too buried? What's that? Is it too buried? Mm, not what I'm looking for. <laughs> Yeah, it's out of, who said that? Out of alignment. Okay, you, you get 20 bucks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty straight, and then right at the curve, you can see it starting to, it actually creates a reverse curve. Now, even though it's very slight, if, you know, these are conditions that going from a left-hand curve into a right-hand curve, you create a, a, a pretty, uh, serious issue for the track to lock up or for the cars to lock up, because rail cars don't slew a whole lot. Um, if, you know, not much at all, especially if there's, if there's a problem with the rail car. So again, this is very slight, but this is something that if you're, um, if you got an industry lead or something where a train's going 25 miles per hour, a little bit faster, it's actually gonna be fighting itself. And that's a, that's, that is a pretty sharp curve. Um, so again, this is something that's not gonna happen overnight, but if you see it and it's not getting repaired, this is where you wanna have a consultant con contractor that, will, that you can reach out to and ask the question, have them come out, take a picture, or, what, or whatever it is. <laughs> Wish I had another hat. You got 20 extra bucks on you? <laughs> So, is there, can you guys tell me what this is? Splice bar, angle bar? What's another name for it that I was probably five years into the business before I actually heard, knew what it was? <laughs> okay, well, there's a lot of these up in Minnesota that live in the 10,000 lakes that you guys allegedly have. A fish plate. <laughs> so, just a little. I, I remember I didn't want to ask the question because I came into my dad's company and I didn't want to be Papa's boy and say, Dad, a frog and a fish on a railroad track? I didn't know what it was for a long time. So um, you always just want to make sure any, any, at any joint you have a good bearing tie. Um, for most of the track that the industry um, owns, it's called an accepted track, so there's not really any guidelines for proper uh, amount of ties, bad joints, and all the, the criteria that the FRA establishes, but here in the last probably three to five years, a lot of the railroads are coming in and doing inspections and holding the industry tracks accountable to a class two standard. So a class two standard says that all joint ties need to be in a good bearing condition, and you should have that anyway, because if you have a fail tie right at a joint, and that presses too much, I mean, these bars, they do break. And if you break that bar, you in essence have a broken rail. And at any given time, that rail can just slide out and the train's gonna go down. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that uh, made my dad successful, you know, we had a very successful company and one of the reasons I came to VAA is the, is the honesty. So I also try to be very honest with folks. Straight track oop, <laughs> does allow you to sneak by with some things that are, just, that are not right. If you're going slow speeds, that doesn't mean you shouldn't repair them, but if you've got a long list of items that need to be repaired and you got these three or four items over here under, that are in straight track, Okay, you might, and if money is really an issue, let, let's focus on curves, let's focus on pits, turnouts, those are your, those are your dangerous areas. If you are in straight track, because here you don't have very good shoulder on, on your ties, but there's no lateral forces, that train is going straight. Now again, they're bad car, improperly loaded car, so it's pushing to one side. Yeah, it can cause a little bit of lateral pressure, but for the most part, it's just going straight, the, all, the, all the weight's going down. <laughs> This condition here, what are, some, what are some things you're seeing that aren't good? 
What's that? Broken ties. Broken ties. Vegetation, so there's a lot of mud in the tracks. Um, you know, it's, it, there's a little bit of kinks and little misalignments. So there's nothing here that is, is intimate, but if, like I said again, if it comes down to a money situation, this would be where you can, you can just kind of sneak by on, for a year or two on straight tracks. <laughs> All right, it's not your guys' turn to talk, and I got about seven minutes, so what do you think's happening here? What's that? Poor subgrade. Yeah, my guess is poor subgrade, it's pumping, and that's causing the asphalt road, especially the road next to it, um, to break. Um, right now you got really good ties, um, so you're probably not having an issue with your track, but there's obviously something that's gonna eventually be a problem. Okay, what, what's, what about this? Too large gauge. Your gauge is too large, it's <laughs> crushing the inside. Well, you're gonna see on the next slide, this is, it's either a vertical split head or a wet head separation. Or, or, um, that rail's probably, it's got a gas pocket on the inside that's been there since manufactured. And now after years, it, it's starting to show itself. Broken rails is one of the things that you can help as your teammate, your, your local guys can help more than anything. Because we could, everyone in this room could go walk the same track and not find a broken rail, and the very next train that goes over it can break a rail. But sometimes there are signs. Here, this probably started, this flaking probably started happening first before you actually saw that crack. So, um, but it, it can happen so quick. <laughs> okay, what about this one over here? <laughs> well, you guys are blind. <laughs> This is probably a sun kink. Who knows what a sun kink is? Nick? Yeah. <coughs> Rail's going to expand and contract. It's like still bends and other things. And if it gets where all the joints get too tight and it has nowhere to go and it gets hot enough, it's not the air temperature, it's the rail temperature. It, it can actually, it'll, it's, it's going to kick somewhere. Um, we were in Crawfordsville, Indiana, when I was 18, working as a laborer with my dad, and all of a sudden I hear my dad start screaming, run, run, and we all look up like, what, you know, and he's, he, then he says it with another word in front of it. Um, and so we all run, all of a sudden that track flips up. And it, I don't know how high it went up, but it settled back down, it was probably six foot in the air the track was sitting. And like, what, and that's what happened, it had nowhere to go. And so when it went, it went. Um, um, so it, it's pretty crazy what, what can happen with rail. Um, okay. Oh. Is there a standard on either lining your splice plates or offsetting them? Like this photo on the left has both rails spliced at the same spot. The last picture. <laughs> right. That's the reason um, I wanted to use this picture. Great point. Yes, you're supposed to, these joints are supposed to be staggered. On a 39 foot rail, you try to keep it at 19 and a half, but sometimes in curves, you know, just because of the outside rails longer than the inside, the, the minimum is 12 foot. 80 foot rails, because well, there's a lot of new rail manufacturing, 80 foot links out, they also have a standard. When you build the rail to prevent stuff like this, you actually are supposed to measure the rail temperature. Then you, there's a chart that every rail produces that tells you how much of a gap you're supposed to leave in between the rails when you initially build the track. You're also supposed to lubricate the joint bars when you join them together so the track is free to move. So there are things that can be done, but I mean, honestly, most contractors don't know that. And probably 50 years ago, no one really cared about it. You know, it's, you know, things that, that have happened. But here what you have is what they call a pull apart. It, this happens all the time. <laughs> if it gets about two and a half, three inches, okay, you need to get it repaired. I mean, if you need to repair it no matter what, but it becomes about two and a half, three inches, it, you know, the railroad can shut you down, you need to get it shut down. So you got, great point, joints right across from each other. You've got to pull apart here. You can see here how the rails are different heights. You've got a lip joint. So because whoever built this put these joints across from each other, the rail is pumping. You can see the ballast is on, up on top, almost to the top of the rail. So that track is sunk, the rail, you know, the ballast is coming up, you're getting a pull apart. That bolt probably broke because it's pumping so bad. 
So this would be one of those spots that, that the railroad is very likely to come in and say, hey, you're done until you get this repaired. But there's been indication for a year or more that this, that this was happening. Um, so again, that's where it's, you know, depending on your facility, the, the developing that teamwork so they can say, okay, hey, something's happening here, come out and take a look. All right, I've been told I talk too much, so I'm about wrapped up. Broken rails are very hard to detect. <laughs> I'm not no, you know, again, your facilities, where you're at, where you're at in, in, in this type of industry and who's online, but there is Sperry testing. If you have a super large facility and you're getting some broken rails or what, whatever, they actually can come out and they can measure, they, they take ultrasonic radar of your, of your rails and tell you if you have you know, some shelling going on, or the gas pocket. This right here is a transverse defect, so that little, that gas pocket runs all the way the length of the rail. It may be that way for two years, but again, if you have that, which you can't visually see, that rail can pop in, 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 under the next train movement. <laughs> so the key takeaways is your rail could be great Monday, train comes in, bad on Tuesdays. Um, you know, everyone, your contractor, consultant should be trained for these defects, they probably are, but developing that teamwork can help your guys who see your tracks every day be more proactive in reducing some major problems. So, any questions? Mike. Yes, sir. How often should you uh, inspect your track? Well, it all depends on the frequency of your trains, how, what type of facility you have, um, and the overall conditions. We have, I shouldn't say we, I'm now VAA, but the, my old company, we had five sites that we have four guys at full time. They're there every day to, and they, they look at the tracks. Um, some of the uh, oil facilities down, down in Houston, Texas, they might have 12 to 16 rail guys at their facility. So that's where talking to your contractor, talking you know, to your consultant, talking to VAA can help you determine that number of times. Do you find more often that it's an issue of money or you know, exposure to information? <laughs> That's a great, that, that it really is a good question. Can you repeat it? Yeah, uh, he's asking is it sometimes maybe not doing maintenance more of an issue of money or more of the, not, not having the exposure to the, that, that person not having the exposure to the rail? Did I, some of that, right? Yeah, I would say it's probably, I'm gonna say 50-50. Um, I could bore you some stories where I, I got yelled at a lot, and I'd go to the quote that I wrote up and say, "Look, sir, I had this right. I had this right here. I wanted to fix it, but you told me you didn't have the money. I can't be responsible for that because I told you to fix it. It's probably half and half." <laughs> what kind of technologies are you seeing with track inspections? Is it, is it all <coughs> visual, or are people utilizing drones or anything of that nature? <laughs> I have heard, he's asking what type of technology, are they using drones for track inspections? And maybe we'll refer to James here after I answer. From an industrial standpoint, I have not heard of drones being used because you really can't tell condition of ties. A lot of times you'll step on a tie that looks really good, but it's completely rotted on the inside. And your, and your heel will actually sink into the tie. Drone's not gonna see that. Uh, drone's not gonna see those little cracks in the rail that are, that are indication that, okay, you, you're something going wrong here. Um, now, I think for maybe some overall drainage and stuff and bridges, James, are, are main lines using drones for inspections? Yeah, I think our company's been working with some of the drone technology. Um, primarily, but it's not a, a complete, you know, we don't rely 100% on it. It's, you still gotta do the manual inspections, but it helps to um, increase the, the efficiency of looking at more bridges and then analyzing. And then I think just the industry in general, I think they're using some uh, LIDAR technology um, on mainline inspections. We've always had our geometry cars that'll run along our main lines. Um, I don't think they're getting much into like the industries like that, you know, the the privately owned industries, but that's what we're doing on our main lines. Okay. Okay. I have been given the, oh, go ahead. Just one quick. Uh, yep. Good. Uh, so we deal a lot with um, 
custom freight cars, a lot of heavy moving on tops of tracks, sometimes uh, traveling mooring bits or tow haulage bits. Um, and one thing we always run into is can the track take it? Yep. So from a capacity perspective, is there anything you look for to know whether the track is being overloaded or has been overloaded or uh, something that you can do to talk to the owner to say you need to get this evaluated before we're comfortable putting these loads on it? Yeah. Um, metallurgically, certain rail sections have the capacity to handle certain weight. Um, it's, it's a long question and maybe we can talk afterwards. You know. Um, if you see a lot of pumping, you see a lot of ba the ballast coming up in, into the into the tie, the cribs of the ties. Um, you see a lot of mud because it's usually that pumping, and when the ballast comes up, the mud start to you know penetrate it. Yeah, they're, they're loading the cars too heavy. We took care of a lot of steel mills that would weigh their cars 500,000 pounds to make internal movements because it was more efficient for them, but it destroyed their track. So yes, there are visual signs that you can definitely see that things are being overloaded. Mike, awesome job. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. So I, I told you you'd make it exciting, right? I tried, Throwing I tried.